Well, I guess your patience has been rewarded. I wasn't really planning on going through this franchise book by book per se, as you'd think each part makes a more than apt breakpoint, but we saw how well that turned out. Volume 1 had so much physically happening that highlighting the differences between it and the anime, the format that most people are familiar with, took up so much time that I had to split Volume 2 and 3 off into their own videos. So I guess I'm just going to keep that format going forward. Now the series going forward doesn't have that many events happening per book, and I can understand why Volume 1 did, it's establishing the entire series, but Volume 2 on goes into more depth, exploring each event in detail, while tying them to the plot of the volume, the part, as well as the overarching one in the series. Even trying to summarize, there's so much important crap packed into these that I can't well gloss over it, I'd miss something important. So with that said, we ended on a cliffhanger last time, with Pine helping Lutz, us learning more about her ailment, and a bright future ahead for the rest of the cast. Let's get on into part two. Picking up where we last left off, we start once again with a prologue as is a theme in this series. These are our few glimpses at other perspectives than mine's, where her common sense and feelings are stripped and it highlights just how abnormal she is. So we begin with Tuli making dinner with her mom while they wait for mine to come back from her meeting with Oto. Tuli talks to Effa about how Lutz won't get this apprenticeship because mine just learned the previous day that this meeting was basically an introduction to get one. She also remarks that mine doesn't seem like mine anymore, because while she still does get sick, she doesn't whine as much about things not being fair. Instead, she now tries to do stuff and works for things. Effa tells her that's pretty much what babies do. And since mine is little still, she's just growing up a bit late. Since they can't imagine this interview going well, they just resolve to cheer mine up when she comes home depressed about failing. Now over to Lutz and mine coming home. Mine is trying to organize her thoughts on how to make paper because she knows the process, roughly, but they need to make tools and gather materials to succeed. They confirm that Mine will tell him what to do, but he'll have to do all the labor. When Mine does actually come home and Tuli tries to cheer her up, Mine doesn't really, uh, need it, because they've been accepted if they complete this task, and that blows her family away. They're also excited for her and wish her luck on her test for her apprenticeship. She writes down what she and Lutz need on her stone slate, explaining how to make some of the key tools. And when she can't explain, she just draws them. But their first real roadblock is, sadly, nails to actually hold crap together. Mine has an idea for that, though. Since she works for Oto, she'll try and work for nails instead of slate pens for a bit. But Oto shoots back with an offer. Teach him how to make the shampoo and he'll get her nails. But Mine, seeing his merchant spirit ablaze, tells him she won't give it to him since, uh, she recognizes that it's valuable. Yeah, she knows that Benno will kill for that knowledge, and instead offers to do what Odo really wants, wash his wife's hair in exchange for the nails. Oto compliments Mine on her keen eyes, seeing Benno's reaction, and agrees to the deal. So Mine tells Lutz she got a way to get nails, and she needs his help to make some shampoo. Eh, which he does. Now Lutz knows how to make it too, but Mine explains why they need to keep it a trade secret, since it's unfortunately pretty easy to make, and if people found out it would essentially make an otherwise premium product absolutely worthless. A few days later, Mine receives an actual letter of invitation to Corina's house through Oto. So here we learn the importance of these, and while this seems trivial as a world building aspect, it's actually laying out the entire foundation of the society in this world. Why those of lower status have to respect those of higher status. Probably more importantly is just how these things are meant to be handled. Because no really isn't an option most of the time. But there are situations where somebody of lower status can decline somebody of higher status. Like I said, this seems kind of trivial right now, but it's actually really important going forward. So Oto gives her an invitation from Karina, who is a high-ranking member of the Tailor's Guild that Tuli and Effa belong to. Since the invitation is from her, Mine's family, uh, can't refuse. Or the implication is that Effa and Tuli's job prospects would suffer. An invitation from someone higher status than you is essentially a summons. However, if the letter came from Oto, they could decline as Gunther's Oto's superior. Yeah, this seems, uh, needlessly complicated when trying to figure out who is higher status than who, but it's important, as Mine meets with increasingly influential people through the course of this series and her role shifts. So Mine's mom panics at the invitation and tells Mine she absolutely has to go and be on her best behavior. Tuli is, uh, a bit jealous and wants to go, 
but Effa is firm that she can't because that would be rude. Mine meets up with Oto and they go to his house, which is on the third floor of a building close to the inner wall where nobility resides, which means rent is astronomically more there. Oto, when he married, married into Karina's family, not the other way around so it's her family's building. Also, the closer to the inner wall you are, the richer people are, the higher rent is, and Oto lives in a seven-story building on the third floor. So since the first floor is generally the store of the owner, they live on the second floor, and the third to the second highest are usually rented out, that tells you just how well off they are. It also puts mine's living situation into perspective, living by the gate on the fifth floor. Anyway, Mai meets with Karina, talks for a bit, and is super impressed by her house, as it's covered in cloth. Though, rich people aren't exactly living terribly different from her. The furniture is still wood and simply carved, no real ornamentation. But the big sign of wealth is tapestry and carpets. So Mine gets down to business, washes Karina's hair, and teaches her how to do it. And while doing so, chats about how Oto is doing, since Karina is worried he gave up on his dreams to be with her. Mine reassures her that his merchant spirit is alive and well, and that puts Karina at ease. When Oto finally sees her with her silky smooth hair, he kicks mine out with the whole bag of nails and is off to Bone Town. On her way home, that bag of nails is feeling pretty heavy for mine's weak body, so she takes a rest and bumps into Lutz. He was out doing some research on wood for mine because she needs specific types for paper. Yeah, young, soft, long fibers work best. So after getting some knowledge, he bumped into her heading home and offered to carry the nails for her. But mine keeps them at her house because Lutz's family would just steal them. Remember, he's a uh, son of a carpenter. Later, the two are in the forest cutting wood to make the sukkata, or a frame for sifting pulp into an even layer. And uh, it's not going great, since they need this thing to be straight and they're trying to do some of the slats with bamboo. Problem is, they need better tools. And mine asks Lutz if his carpenter father would lend them the tools to do it but he's doubtful since his family isn't pleased with him trying to be a merchant. After struggling for a while, they head back and get pulled aside by Oto, who says that Benno wants to see them tomorrow at the Gilberta Company. Mine doesn't know where that is, but Oto says it's Benno's store on the first floor of his building. Since Corina lives in her family home and it's Benno's store, the overprotective brother that Oto mentioned when telling the story about marrying Corina was Benno, which means anything Mine tells Oto is going right to Benno. So much for her game of chess, because Benno had an inside track. Having heard about the shampoo, Benno summoned Lutz and mine. They go there the next day for a lunch meeting, and it's a fancy store. But around noon, the place clears out for mealtime, leaving one person to guard the store. Mine approaches and he nods, knowing who they are and what they're there for. After a bit, he lets them in so that they can meet with Benno. And he says that he has some things to discuss with them, but they're gonna eat first. Mine was briefly worried about eating like a poor person. But seeing that Benno doesn't eat any differently, makes her more relaxed. She also learns it's customary to leave food on your plate or else you'll be given more. And turns out rich people don't eat anything different than poor people. Just, uh, more of it. When the business talk kicks in, he demands to know why they went to Oto for help and not him. But mine is at a loss. She thought this was a test to see what they could do. But to the contrary, Benno is pretty much their boss already, so going to Oto? is just a slap in the face to him. With that cleared up, it's laid out that Benno will back them financially to make paper. But in return, Mine will sell her rights to the shampoo so that funding carries on until they're baptized, while also hammering out the profits of the paper sales. They decide to set this all in stone with a contract. So Benno leaves to get that in order. While he's gone, he has Mark, his right-hand man, teach Mine and Lutz some basic stuff. For Lutz, it's letters, and for mine, it's learning to write supply orders so that she can get materials and tools for making paper. When Benno returns, they sign a magic contract, which is mine learning for the very first time that, hey, she lives in a fantasy world. Unfortunately for her, magic, at least concern for commoners, runs on blood. It's also incredibly expensive and not things that they do on a regular basis, so she has to get cut to seal the contract. Traumatic as that is, it won't be the last time for her. Magic contracts are super expensive, using special mana-infused ink, and is basically Benno's way of saying that this is a big deal to him. And, uh, don't break the contract. It could literally cost them their lives. After leaving the store, Lutz was real quiet the whole time, and finally asks Mine what's up with her, because she was talking on equal footing with an adult. He asks if she's really Mine. Mine asks kinda dumbly, who else would she be? realizing that she done fucked up by letting too much of her power level show in front of a normie. Things just aren't going good for mine now that she's raised lots of suspicion. Now she's scared what will happen next. 
She assumes people will try and kill her for being a witch or something, but at least she has an out by letting the heat inside her swallow her whole if she wants. And putting that on the back burner for now, Lutz goes to the wood the next day to gather, which means mine can go to Benno's store and finish writing supply orders. She goes with Mark to drop them off, but collapses on her way to their first stop, the lumberyard, because she didn't realize she was tired, despite Lutz asking if she was okay to go on her own. When she wakes up, she's sick in Karina's bed. Benno plows into the room once he knows that she's up and says that she damn near gave him a heart attack. He kicks mine out of his house by having Mark take her home, carrying her the whole way because she damn near gave him a heart attack too. But mine wants to teach him how to make the shampoo first, but that just pisses Benno off and he yells at her to go home and not come back unless Lutz is with her. This is sort of the actual start of mine and Benno's relationship, where their roles become more solidified. Benno being the resourceful merchant who puts mine's brain to use, but also his constant headache at her airheadedness as well as her inability to put on the brakes. After her fever finally went down, she musters the courage to ask Lutz to go with her. And uh, he just kinda laughs. He agrees to go, but it also just puts him at ease. That yeah, mine might be able to talk to a merchant on equal footing, but she's still weak and useless outside and that makes Lutz feel needed. Yeah, his big worry was being replaced. They go ahead and meet with Benno and he flat out tells Lutz that he's mine's official keeper now, giving him a purpose. After that, Mark guides the two kids to the workshop mine requested of Benno, so that they could store their tools such that they wouldn't be stolen by their families. Here it's pointed out that items needed to be ordered through and delivered to the Gilberta company, and from there sent to their workshop. That's all to fulfill the contract that they signed. So they had a pot and ashes waiting for them, but a tub and weights will be brought shortly so they have to wait there. Mark gives them a key and leaves, while the kids prep before calling it a day. The next day, they go to the lumber yard where Mine struggles to explain the sort of wood she needs, but is basically told they don't deal with young trees like she's looking for, unless specially ordered. They buy a bunch of other wood, but for their experiments, Lutz will have to do the hard work, identifying and cutting it himself. A few days later, Mark has scheduled an appointment for the kids to meet with a craftsman. He takes on the bamboo strips after seeing the kids couldn't get them straight, and for the screen he says he'll do it but it'll be a pain, plus they need real sturdy string for it. But Mine doesn't understand what he means exactly, so they take the craftsman to a thread dealer, just so that they can order the right stuff. It becomes a sort of running gag at this point that Mine ends up getting carried everywhere. After ordering some expensive ass thread, they call it a day again. Mine ends up with a fever anyway after being carried, but Lutz and Mark go buy some sticky fruit that they're gonna use as a binding agent for the paper. And this is also so Lutz can get some experience working without Mine. By this point, now that it's been a month and a half since meeting Benno, Mine is ready to actually do the thing she said she would, make him some paper. Mine is, of course, super excited to get started, so Lutz has to get her to calm down. But they begin by cutting down different wood to try out. Getting out into the forest was a pain in the ass though, since they designed everything so Lutz could carry it. But they never factored in that he would have to carry it all at once. Bunch of fucking geniuses here. Kids are also asking them a bunch of questions. But Lutz tells them it's for an apprenticeship, and that gets them to leave him alone for fear that if they mess him up, he'd mess them up when they had their own tusks. But Lutz and mine do eventually get out there, make a makeshift hearth, and start a fire. While Lutz is out gathering wood, Mine tends to the fire, but runs out of sticks to throw on, and sees a weird fruit half buried in the ground. She digs it up, wondering if it's edible, but it suddenly feels super hot, so she throws it. It crackles and spews out a bunch of little seeds that all immediately sprout flailing branches, which causes Mine to scream. Lutz comes rushing back and blows a whistle yelling trombe to get the other kids to gather and cut it down. Mine tries to run as far as she can, but just physically can't, so she sits down by the river while the kids chop it down. This trombe strikes Lutz as strange, since they usually suck nutrients out of the ground in an instant, plus appear later in the season than it is. But this one was early, and the ground seems fine. Mine doesn't really see what he's talking about, and uh, that sort of annoys him. But it's also her first time seeing it, so she can't really judge if it's abnormal or not. They decide to try and make paper out of the wood from the trombe on a whim, and uh, get boiling. While waiting, Mine tries to gather food for her family, but like half of it is poisonous. When they get back to the storage unit after washing off the black bark in the river from the boiled wood, they decide to dry it on their baskets over the next few days while gathering. The next step is, after it dries, soak it in water overnight, so they make a little rock cage in the river to do just that. They also decide to try other wood now too, since trombe wood isn't a viable source. So more wood is boiled, peeled, and rest on their baskets while they prep the peeled trombe black bark. Now, uh, 
white bark, by boiling it again with ash. About this point, Mine realizes that she needs something to stir and fish the wood out with, so she asks Lutz to make her some chopsticks without actually calling them that. And when he sees Mine using them effortlessly, he goes even further beyond and becomes super suspicious. Remember, this is now basically red flag number two that something's up with this girl. They wash off the white bark and let it dry in the sun before taking it back to the warehouse. The next day, they clean the fibers of useless bits and process it into actual paper. So they take these fibers, smash them with a crude mallet until fluffy, mix it with the sticky fruit juice and water into a mash, while sifting it in a sucetta to get the right thickness. Let's watch his mind do this, because remember, she's made paper from milk cartons before a Zerano, so she's doing a really good job. And uh, when Lutz asks to confirm that she really knows what she's doing, she says confidently that she does because she's done it before. <laughs> That's a rookie mistake. Mine realizes this fuck up almost immediately when Lutz asks her when and where, and tries to cover for her clumsily by saying it's a girl's secret. But Lutz is assuredly onto her at this point, especially when he asks her why she moves it like she is and she explains that it regulates the thickness and such. These are just starting to pile up, even Mine's remarking that she just climbed up a cliff to throw herself off again. After swishing the pulp and getting a layer, they leave it on the drying bed. Lutz asks what's next, and Mine says that they need to squeeze it between weights to get more water out. Then it'll basically be done. Lutz mentions that she sure knows a lot about this, and oh yeah, didn't she mention that she's done this before? Yeah, that's basically just a deer in the headlights look right there. So from there, they call it a day, and Mime basically just imagines all the horrible stuff that Lutz is going to say to her when he confronts her about this. The next day, after they gather the bark that they left in the forest soaking, Lutz hints that he wants to talk to her after they finish their paper. And uh, for the record, he hasn't been calling her Mine since. The next day, the paper is basically done, but Mine keeps trying to put it off so that she doesn't have to have this conversation. But Lutz says that he really needs to talk. The question he starts with is, who is she? But for mine, or rather the person who is mine now, she still considers herself a Rano, but no matter how you look at it, she is mine. After spending a year in that body and how much she's changed from a girl who lazed about reading and following her whims, to someone who puts in effort to survive and reach her goals, she can't really say she isn't mine now. But she never actually answered Lutz, so he asks a follow-up, that she knows how to make paper because she's made it before, and there's no way mine would know how to do that. So Arano basically says Mine didn't know anything about anything. Lutz demands to know who she is and that she give Mine back. And Arano just says that she could, but they'd best go home first. Because the only thing left will probably be a corpse, and she doesn't want Lutz blamed for her death. He asks if she's the heat she talked about with Benno and Oto, and Arano replies that Lutz is sort of right. She recants Mine's last thoughts, and confirms that she isn't the heat for Lutz, and that it's trying to eat her too. Lutz thought this was an evil spirit or something, but now he's confronted with this person suffering the same fate as mine, when he thought that she stole mine from him and that she's evil. But Arano screams back that she didn't take this body because she wanted it. She died, and if she could have chosen, she would have chosen a noble's body or something, one that could, like, actually afford books and wasn't sickly. When she asks Lutz if she should disappear, Lutz doesn't want that sort of responsibility, but Arano tells him that he's the reason that she's there at all, because of their promise. He sort of brushes that off, and asks how long she's been mine. To which she asks when does he think she became mine. He points to her hair stick and she's sort of surprised by that astute observation, and tells him that he's right. Which means most of Lutz's memories of mine are of Irano. Besides, her family hasn't even noticed. Well, not true. Tuli and Effa have noticed, but brush it off as mine growing up. So she asks Lutz if he's okay with her staying. And he says that he wants her to. He's fine with her being his mine. Isn't that cute? As for the paper, some of it turned out okay. Others didn't. The trombe paper was a success, so Mine says that maybe they should look for more trombe seeds. And Lutz yells at her to not do that because she'd destroy the whole forest. And another wood they tried, Vulrin, makes acceptable paper that could be sold. So they're off to the races, by showing Benno the two types of paper they made. Or, not yet. Mine asks Oto how to write a thank you letter, and Oto is puzzled. That's typically something only nobles do, and merchants just typically send some of their product they sell as thanks. So Mine decides that since their product is paper, they make a special type, with some common flowers that look like red clovers pressed into it, creating a nice floral stamp. They sign it, thanking him for their support, and Mine folds an origami crane out of another, which they present to Benno. 
Turns out the paper is great. Writing on it is even easier than parchment, though it does bleed the ink slightly, but that's not really a problem. So he buys it off them and takes them on as unofficial apprentices in his store. Trumbe paper's the best though, which shocks Benno when he learns exactly what it's made out of. Their thank you letter's a big hit though. One, for the status symbol of getting one, and two, the paper will make a nice additional product, possibly being sold to noble women at a premium. Mine also shows Benno the hairpin that she made for Thule for her baptism and asks if he thinks it'll sell. Benno is, um, immediately floored because he's been looking for whoever the hell made those to secure a deal to sell them in his store. Mine is looking at doing those as her winter handiwork, and Benno is on board selling them. But having done all this, Benno takes the kids off to the merchant guild to get them registered so that they can do all this stuff. There they learn a bit about the commerce in the city, where stall merchants or people temporarily selling stuff apply for seasonal permits and such on the second floor, but full merchants go to the third floor through a magic gate. The first floor is full of carriages so they're not blocking the main square of the city with traffic. We also learn that Benno is having issues with the Guildmaster since Benno's store is expanding so quickly, and the Guildmaster Gustav is fighting him hard on that, since he already deals with nobility so another store muscling in on that would be a problem for him. Benno wants to get mine and Lutz temporary registration so that they can do business in his store, which is highly unusual, as that's mostly done by merchant parents so their kids can mine the store while they're out doing something. Mine's main interest on that floor, however, is a bookshelf that has some etiquette, a list of nobles, and a map. We learn that the city's name is Aaronfest, which is also the name of the local lord. Hey, that's a name that popped up in Volume 1, which is more confusing, as it's also the name of the duchy itself. Mine asks Benno for a slate for Lutz so that he can learn to read over winter, and then they meet with the guildmaster, because he's not letting his rival Benno slip two unrelated kids into the system without some serious inquiry. Mine recognizes that the hairpin is a smokescreen to hide the real product, the paper. So when Gustav says he's not really willing to let the kids be registered, Benno signals Mine, and she shows him the hairpin, which is Benno's plan coming to light. Gustav wants that pin for his granddaughter's baptism coming up in winter, so he offers to buy it, but Mine declines immediately. It's hashed out that she'll make one for his granddaughter, but he wanted it to be a surprise, so he says make it the same as Thule's. Mine disagrees and says that she wants to meet with her and make a custom pin to match her hair. After some debate and getting the guildmaster to understand that a genuine smile versus an unwanted surprise is best, he agrees to have Mine meet with his granddaughter, Frida. Benno is a bit annoyed by this because Frida takes after her granddad the most in his whole family and tells Mine to be careful. After all, Gustav tried to lure her away and they had to tell her to flatly refuse, otherwise he wouldn't stop. Also, they're charging an arm and a leg for this hairpin. Multiple small silver coins, which is like two or three months salary for mine's dad. But hey, the paper sold too, which means they got some cash. How much? A lot. Volrim paper, which is about the size of a postcard, is two small silvers, and each trombe paper is four. They sold three each, so that's 18 small silver coins. And they're getting 20% due to the handling fee from Benno and his initial investment. So mine and Lutz are both getting one small silver and eight large copper coins. The money is a base 10 system, with a small copper coin being worth 10 lions, 100 for a middle copper, 1000 for a large. For silver and gold, they just come in small and large. So add a zero at the end for each jump and you've got the money system. And two bad lions are pretty much never mentioned again, as everything goes by coins from here on out. It's also kind of neat that the currency is lions, and that might have some more relevance later when we learn about the Archduke. Mine deposits the silver coin in a bank account because that's essentially how the guild functions, with their membership cards stamped with their blood working as a debit card, which means they're taking the coppers home to their families. So they end up meeting with Frida later and she's a little annoyed that Lutz is there too. Mine explains that she's weak and needs Lutz's help or she might collapse, and Frida asks if she has the devouring. Mine is confused, of course, because this is the first she's heard of it, but Frida explains the exact symptoms that she has. And when Mine asks how she knows about it, Frida has it too. Or as she puts it, had. It costs a fortune to, massive air quotes here, cure the devouring. Though being devoted to something or having a goal helps hold it off. They go to Frida's house, talk with her a bit, get some sweets, which almost immediately sways Mine, but luckily Lutz is there. They see her baptism dress, notice red is the running theme, which I'd hope so, that's kind of the divine color of winter, and also notice that Frida does two puffy ponytails on each side of her head, or as you weebs might understand it, twin tails. So she'll need two hairpins. Since she's supplying the high quality red thread, 
Mine wants to do the second for free, since they're already charging four small silvers. Frida says no, she's willing to pay eight for the whole package. And this conversation goes on entirely too long until Lutz strikes a compromise and says they'll take six for both, since mine wants to be nice and Frida wants it to be fair. We learned Frida's goal was counting money. Yeah, that's what kept her from dying. She loves money about as much as mine loves books, so everyone sees them as similar. So everyone sees them as similar, but mine thinks Frida is a weirdo. Until everyone points out exactly how weird mine is to her. And that makes her cry out an apology to Tuli when she gets home because she's been such a weird little sister. This is mine getting some self-awareness, and while I want to say I wish it sticks, because it does, it's just that she needs constant reminders that she's a little oddball and she needs to take that into consideration. It comes up in different ways that her perspective is distorted, and I mean hell, it should. She's from a different world, so her common sense isn't everyone else's. Meaning she shouldn't charge forward based on what she thinks is normal. But Frida was quite taken by mine and declares her her friend. On the way home, they meet up with Benno and he asks how it went. Mine reluctantly explains how they're now making two pins and only charging half as much for the second, and Benno verbally backhands her for throwing money down the drain. But ultimately it comes out of their share, so it's whatever. Mine goes home, sees Tuli, and tells her about Frida and the devouring, and she says that she needs a ton of money. And Tuli is pretty much like, yeah, that won't happen. Which was mine's attitude too. Yeah, they're fucking dirt poor. Tuli also sort of confirms the whole needing a goal thing, since mine's been more energetic since having some. That night, Mine starts making Frida's hairpin, and her mom and Tuli are both interested in it, because the thread is high quality and Mine's making a new type of flower. Roses. With Effa and Tuli helping, it doesn't take long. The next day, Lutz and Mine place an order for thread for winter handiwork, as well as some white thread to finish up Frida's hairpins. She also tells Lutz they'll finish faster than expected, because Effa and Tuli work quicker than her. When they do finish, they stop by Benno's to show him the finished product, but he was out with a noble customer. However, he finished right when Mine and Lutz arrived, so he got to see their work. He tells Mine that she shouldn't have discounted the second pin, even though they overcharged, because these are luxury goods. You know, Frida's was even extra special, since they made it custom for her. The three go to the guild to set up a meeting to deliver them to Frida, but Gustav pulls them in to see what they've made. Mine is a bit shy about showing him, though, because he remarks how different they look, especially compared to Tuli's. She's essentially worried that he doesn't like them since they're not the exact same, but he puts her at ease by saying they'll fit her perfectly, and he just wasn't expecting it to be so splendid. He tells Mine to deliver them directly, because Frida was happy to finally make a friend her age. However, Mine's a bit confused because she didn't realize Gustav meant her. But before they can go, Gustav snatches up Mine, with Lutz and Benno following behind into a carriage to deliver the items. Once there, Gustav pulls Benno into a parlor to talk, while Mine shows Frida, who is stunned. She reaffirms how absolutely amazing these are, because for kids born in winter, they can't easily get flowers for their baptism. But for her to make a 3D flower hair ornament with a fundamentally new technique means these are special and a huge deal even if this was a home craft sort of deal back home for Urano. This is where she finally starts to grasp the gravity of introducing things into this world. Once the hairpins are transferred though, Frida wants Mine to be her friend, and wishes that she'd come to visit. But uh, Mine can't because winter preparations are coming up. So Frida's sad, but she understands, and still hopes that she'll come visit soonish. When they get paid by Benno, Mine once again puts the silvers in the bank and takes the coppers home. Lutz has been doing the same thing and asks why she's doing that which Mine says they may need money down the line, especially Lutz, since his family hasn't really given their blessing for him being a merchant yet, meaning he may have to bail and be a live-in apprentice, which requires money to survive on his own. Benno wants to discuss the price for hairpins, but Mine's not looking great, because it's about that time of year for her to start getting constantly sick, but she goes regardless with Lutz. Benno is worried, but they decide to get this over with quickly because Mine's healthy days will become more and more rare the colder it gets. So they get down to it, agree to three large coppers for a single hairpin, Mine and Lutz will earn five middle coppers per each one made, and that's Benno being generous. So this is where Mine's brilliant idea to pay their families comes in. She also says they need to start thinking like merchants, and use some of these coppers to pay their family for the winter handiwork, while being like Benno and essentially taking a fee. Effa and Tuli will get two middle coppers for each hairpin they made, while Lutz's family will get one for each wooden locking part. That means Lutz and mine will keep one middle copper for literally no work. Lutz isn't happy about it, but he agrees so that he can practice. Mine finds out that normal winter handiwork doesn't even make a single middle copper per item, 
and Benno finds out that she made baskets last year that people kept talking about because they were such good quality. And of course it was mine. Why wouldn't it be? Once home, mine is whisked off to bed immediately, until he asks how she can help since mine's winter handiwork pays so much more than her jobs. They already have the thread, so they just need needles. Which, uh, they already have thanks to Frida's hairpin. While mine is sick and her family is doing pig day, she figures out what Lutz needs to learn over winter. Math, reading, and talk to Benno about some of the things like clothing and greetings. The next time they meet with him, he says they'll need ten small silvers, or one large silver, I don't know why we didn't convert, for the uniform for his store, and Lutz needs to learn to speak more politely, just like mine does. He, uh, struggles and calls mine sir by accident, but mine proposes he use Mark as an example. Mine asks for more ink and boards for orders, and Benno wants to charge her but decides to be generous. So Benno gives it and asks if that's all she wanted, which, uh, it was. Now he has business for them. The shampoo isn't working, so he needs mine to help him fix it, or else it'll be a breach of contract on her part, and, uh, no one wants that. So they go with Benno, discuss the name because simple all-in-one shampoo doesn't roll off the tongue in this language, and decide on Rinsham. From there, they meet a foreman who demonstrates how they get oil for the Rinsham. Turns out they're using too fine of a cloth and it's removing the pulp from the oil, which is normally good for most other applications, but this makes the Rinsham not work because now there's no scrub. There's Benno's problem. He bought too high a quality of cloth. Mine tells them though it's not really a problem, and this will make a higher quality product in fact, and Mine wishes she could have gotten it this beer to make different kinds of Rinsham. The foreman remarks that she sure knows a lot, which uh, sends up a bit of a red flag for Mine, as more people are about to find out she's… not Mine. But Benno, sensing profit, pulls her aside without Lutz, and tells her he'll pay for all her knowledge relating to improved Rinsham. She declines at first, but Benno tells her that she needs money to fix her devouring. Mine is a bit shocked he knew, but Benno says Gustav told him the other day when they met with Frida for the pins. Mine needs to save money and prepare for the day her heat goes out of control, so he'll pay three small gold, and that makes Mine relent. She tells him to add salt as a scrub. He can also use dried citrus fruit skin from, say, an apple seed, which is a lot like an apple if you couldn't guess. Benno is sort of bewildered by all this information pouring out of Mine. You know, since she couldn't do any of this stuff herself and he asks how the hell she knows despite not being able to do it, and asks exactly who she is on impulse. Mine replies that that's a secret, one that'll cost him a lot more than three small gold coins. But Benno's not one to turn his nose up at profit, and Mine reeks of that, so he decides to drop it and keep doing business with her. Fall is drawing to a close finally, so a trombe appears while Lutz is out gathering, Mine happens to be at the gatehouse that day, and everyone comes in with pieces of it because it got pretty damn big. Large chunks make pretty good furniture, because they don't burn up in a house fire. So Mine's dad has a huge chunk while Lutz, being a good merchant, nabbed all the little tiny branches nobody wanted, and Mine takes more from all the little kids who realize their branches are useless as trophies. That means they can make even more trombe paper for Benno to sell. While writing up supply orders for paper come spring, and firewood for now so that they can make trombe paper, Mine remembers Benno's original agreement, and points out that he said he would cover the costs until their baptism. And, uh, this is part of that, meaning he has to pay for this firewood, despite them paying for all the stuff until now. Benno snickers at that, having taught her a lesson. Remember the contracts you sign. He also asks them to start their winter handiwork now, as he's willing to pay double. So Mine gets an advance and uses it to pay her mom and Tuli for hairpins, later doing the same trick to Lutz's family because they ignored him at first. Mine and Lutz go to make paper at the well by their workshop, and Mine has Lutz bring butter while she steams some potato fills. This is, like, normal. Until Lutz takes a bite and is amazed by how good they taste. Don't ask me why, did nobody ever think to do this? We have some brief foreshadowing as Mine's fever kicks up for a brief second out of nowhere, despite her mood, uh, being good and Lutz is confused by it because it disappears quickly too. Yeah, her devouring is getting worse. On the way back though, they swing through Benno's and get paid for the ornaments they made so that they can pay their families for more work. Later still, Mine collects more pin parts, talks to Lutz's mom Carla about him wanting to be a merchant, but she still doesn't quite understand why he wants to, and we see that paying Lutz in front of his brothers paid off as they're now helping too. So they go to Benno's and sell some more finished pins, discussing new products to sell. And while talking to Benno, Mine's fever flares up out of nowhere, and she passes out, stone cold on the floor. In the epilogue, Lutz is freaking out while Mark gets a carriage ready. Lutz looks to Benno for help, but he can't really do anything about the devouring, 
He only recently got noble connections and doesn't have the kind that could save mine. But the guildmaster has an old junky magic tool he would sell to mine for two small gold coins. Benno prepared for this ahead of time with Gustav while talking to him at his house. So this volume ends with mine being carried off to the guildmaster's house to be saved, at least temporarily, as magic grows inside a person over time. So naturally, mine's devouring will get worse again. Well, that's a crazy stopping point, but <laughs> as we know, these books don't really end at the epilogue, now do they? We've got side stories to discuss, so let's get into those. The first side story is Karina coming home from working with Baron Blonde's daughter for her upcoming Starbine ceremony dress. That's, uh, marriage in this world. Mark sees her upstairs, and it's revealed that Karina is the real future heir of the Gilberta company, and she looks over Mine's recent hairpin she sold. She's interested because they're different, but also Mine's desire to sell them as cheap as possible tells her about her resolve to convince her brother to budge. But mostly, she's just interested how this girl came up with this method to sew. In fact, with Benno sticking his neck out for mine, Karina says she wouldn't fund this girl whose main thing is making paper that's unrelated to the Gilberta company's main product line, clothing for women. She reminisces about her marrying Oto since Mark commented on Benno's intuition and said Karina's is nothing to scoff at. Turns out Oto's parents are in Frembeltag, the neighboring duchy to Ehrenfest, but Oto wanted to settle there instead. However, it's too pricey to be in the city. He meets Corina at a tea party between himself and Benno, who were friends already, proposes immediately, and is shot down because Corina hadn't come of age yet, and Benno wasn't letting her leave. Oto immediately bought his citizenship and comes off as a crazy man trying to get Corina to love him, and we all know how it ends up from there. But the key points are the Guildmaster's oldest son wanted to marry her, and uh, was declined. Feeling the feud between the Guildmaster and Benno a bit more, though it was already going on at this point. Karina obviously accepted, and we learn that Oto is actually a pretty damn good merchant. Back to the present, Karina jokes about having Mine take responsibility since her brother said he would marry after Karina did. Mark thinks about it a bit before saying he would advise against it due to Mine's poor health. Kinda nasty. Next up is gossiping by the well from Effa's perspective. She's down washing dishes on Earth's Day, which is the day off for most people, and Mine's late at getting up as well as being a clean freak was kind of the joke around the neighborhood. Hey, uh, that's foreshadowing for quite a few volumes later. Effa thinks about how strange mine was, and when she was younger, she used to talk about her awesome dreams. How she wished she could stay in her dreams as opposed to real life, which Effa scolds her about thinking she meant that she wanted to die. Now she just acts weird in real life, but has mellowed out some since making paper with Lutz. Carla bitches about Lutz wanting to be a merchant since they're liars, and kind of blames mine thinking she sort of dragged Lutz along. But Effa shrugs it off, saying Lutz is a good kid and they appreciate all he does for them. This chapter is mostly Mine's antics told from Effa's perspective. And without Mine's motives, we see how odd she really is. Putting clay in the hearth to explode, or secretly adding herbs to candles. We also see how alike Gunther and Mine are from Effa's perspective, and why she married him in the first place. It's a pretty sweet side story that gives some more personality to the poorer end of town especially why Effa loves Gunther so much. I actually like this one quite a bit. So with that, we finish the volume proper. And I have to say, these side stories pack in a lot for characters outside the main story. Karina would have been a throwaway in pretty much any other series, a cardboard cutout that Oto dotes over. But here we see she's got a ruthless merchant side to her, as well as a pretty complicated relationship with her beloved husband. She cares for him a lot, but... At the time of their marriage, she basically just accepted to get the Guildmaster's sons to stop harassing her, which means she holds some regrets about shutting down his dreams. The Guildmaster is not going to approve any store of his, so... Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Karina. It's nice to see so much put into the motivations of side characters who barely feature in this part. She doesn't even really start playing a role until part 3 or 4, so... Yeah. But let's talk anime comparison, because I know a lot of people like that, as well as some of the more story-related stuff that people don't really care that much about. Yeah, I see my analytics, I know what people are here for. And that part of the video is over. But I want to say in the storytelling part, there's a lot to unpack, a lot of nuance, and things to draw attention to concerning future volumes, because that demonstrates just how planned out this series is. A lot of the groundwork in Volume 1 is built upon in this book to lay a solid foundation for Mind's reasoning and motives down the line. The main difference between the books and the anime is essentially one is glossing over the details. And this is, uh, kinda hard to frame. Because it's not like the anime is doing a bad job at telling the story by skimming things. 
but it's more that the books are just interested in utilizing their medium to the fullest. We get more information, thought process, and motivation in these than the anime, as we're more privy to Mind's thoughts. Volume 1 translated into about five and a half episodes, where part of episode 6 is taken from this volume, but including that, we're at about four and a half episodes for the anime. The question then becomes, what did it gloss over? Well, I would say travel, as well as time is a bit more compressed. Conversations are translated into exposition, and entire monologues are cut while distilling conversations down. We just get a lot less of minds in her thoughts about what she's experiencing, as it's translated into facial expressions or cute chibi cutaways expressing the core concepts. Mine being told to go to Benno's store for the first time, meeting him, lunch, business discussion, the contract being signed, and Lutz's growing suspicion are practically fully adapted, and that's a few chapters only taking up half an episode. But the paper making process and Lutz confronting mine happen at a quicker pace, essentially with mine just telling the audience what they did in the anime, instead of spending multiple trips in the forest steaming, gathering, washing, peeling, etc. Basically just keeping the core scenes of the series. But this sort of implies that Lutz's suspicion was entirely raised after Benno's, and Mine's other knowledge is an afterthought, as opposed to the multiple events that led him to confronting her in the books. Because, let's face it, a month's time was compressed into half an episode. It's not a poor aspect of the adaptation, but just a part of the process. The heart of that scene still exists, so it demonstrates that the screenwriter understood what's important in the story. Nothing's really lost in the process. More I would say that reading the books is a game, as things feel more fleshed out in there. Small things, like there's zero discussion on how to properly thank Benno for his backing, and instead just skips to them getting paid and showing him the hairpin. Also just sort of funny that in the anime, Benno just throws six small silvers worth of paper away by writing on the whole thing, instead of just cutting off a thin strip like he did in the novels. One of the big things you'll notice is that conversations are shuffled around to avoid a lot of back and forth between locations. This just avoids padding and has little to no impact on the story. Like the kids getting paid happens when they deliver the paper in the anime, as opposed to after the merchants guild in the novels. As for the book itself, this volume contains a lot of foreshadowing for future events, and the implications of those run deep. Things you may not notice particularly well on your first reading, or do establish a certain aspect of the character subtly so we understand their motivations moving forward. Who mine is, even as early as Volume 2, isn't the same as who she was at the start of Volume 1, and juxtaposed to her as Arano, which the story does on a few points in this part, there's a stark change in her as a person. It's touched on a bit when Mine realizes how much she's changed when confronted by Lutz, but it's not just stated and moved on. She reflects on these things, how before she barely gave her own mother the time of day and only cared about reading. Her situation and those around her, who cared and didn't just baby her, forced this sense of purpose in her. She now has initiative, where Hirano didn't, a will to make her desires come true instead of just waiting for them, because otherwise she wouldn't have books in this world. And that's something we don't see in most other isekais, where the characters' experiences in their new world impact their personalities. The character grows over the course of the story, as opposed to remaining stagnant, and that's probably why this franchise stands out above others. And I realize that's not a high bar to clear, but the fact that this one does it so well is why I'm praising it. Book 2 is where Mine's affection starts to show. Her love for her family is becoming abundantly clear by the middle point of this volume, and coming from the last where she barely knew or trusted these people, all the way to a support system for her by the end of Volume 1, she now feels that bond strongly. Why is that? It's not just that she's spent time or they've helped her. Tuli, Effa, and even Gunther play a role for Mine. Not just with support, but also a gentle callousness that spurs her to do better. It's even more apparent here that they become her emotional support through her time in this series. While she realizes how much of a burden she's been to them, and they still love her. Hell, as weird as she is. And we see that from their perspective, coming from the prologue with Tuli and Effa's side story. Mine is abnormal in just about every way, but these people still love and care for her enough to foster that abnormality, instead of stifling it to make her fit in with society. They're there for her to cry to when she gets home, which is what makes them shine as a supporting cast by actually supporting the lead. And it's towards the end of this volume that Mine realizes this world is too fun now that she wants to live in it. Not just for her sake, but for the sake of those around her, because she has friends as well as a family now. But a big shock for Mine this early in the series, and one that impacts her behavior moving forward is, her coming to terms with the mundane objects to her, like shampoo and paper, 
being luxury items in this world. This is a big thing we see after Frida points out to her that her hairpins are absolutely amazing from the local's perspective. She has to shift her mindset from these are quaint, easy to make goods, to now they're extravagant fashion or products to cater to high class needs. It's hard to grasp for her because she grew up on a first world nation on earth, where these were everyday items, or hobbies people took up to fill their free time. But the biggest lesson, and one she'll struggle with for the rest of the series is, she's been haphazardly making these things because she wants her old life back. But these can seriously destabilize commerce in the duchy, or even the whole country. New products like these tend to need to be introduced from the top down to start trends. And mind throwing them in wherever and whenever she wants for arbitrarily low prices because she doesn't see the value, yeah, that's gonna wreak havoc if not controlled. Welcome to Benno's headache for the rest of his life, as he constantly drills into Mind's head that she needs to talk to people before she does something on her own. You know, most second volumes in franchises feel like a bridge from the start of an arc to the end. But this one isn't that, it has a contained arc inside it. Mind learns about her disease while fulfilling promises, as well as resolving herself to see these things through. But I think she mostly just develops her relationships, and that's pretty big. The world in this series grows organically through this volume as she meets higher class merchants and rich people while expanding her own business. And this is a trend that'll continue into the next volume, where the overarching story of part one, Daughter of a Soldier, comes to a conclusion. Does mine succumb to her disease, or does she live to see her baptism? We'll find out in the next video, but for now, you've made it to the end of this one. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with the link down in the description. If you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon where you can pick up some extra perks, like voting on what I do next. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to give a special thanks to Nadeshko for their continued support. Thanks for watching.